Well, first, Holmes was born. Then he got fat, bald, and tired, tired, tired. Sup, Holmes? Beware! Your host, Jonathan Holmes. Hi, everybody. Just one last tweet. I know I was supposed to start the show, but I want more people to watch it. Hi, Lee Alexander. How are you? Hi, I'm, I'm well. How are you? I am not bad. I have just tweeted. Showtime with Lee Alexander. Hey, so thanks knows. for having me. Oh, no. You didn't hear that, did you? Hear what? Oh, good. So, where are you and what are you doing? Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm in London. I'm, I'm on a floor. I'm, and I'm uh, talking to you on an iPad. That's really good resolution for an iPod. That's just like yeah, an iPod it is. I mean, it, it it was my only option for making contact with you because I only really I only brought a netbook with me, and uh, the PC we have here doesn't have a webcam, so I had to well, make do. For, I appreciate you jumping through those hoops just to be <laughs> on our show. People may That's not fun. know it, but you were you've been part of Destructoid, or you started Destructoid before I did. Yeah, it was like my first kind of proper job, kind of. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's destructive for you. Yeah, I think it would have been like 2006, like quite a long time ago, um, in games writing terms. And what got you, yeah, how did I, you start with Destructoid? How did that all happen? Um, well, I had a blog. You know, I had a little blog, which back in the day was called sexyvideogameland.blogspot.com. Important home of me trying really hard to be cool and funny. <laughs> and um, Colette Bennett um, discovered some of my essays, and... Uh, I guess she thought they were good, and she was one of the editors at the time, and uh, she asked me to come and uh, join the team. And so, God, what did I write about? Like, horrible things. Like, I had no idea what I was doing. Um, uh, JRPGs and survival horror, probably. And I wrote a lot about, um, like, sex games and hentai games at the time, uh, so I might have done that. Honestly, I cannot remember for the life of me what I did, but I do remember that. I, was, I remember uh, a lot of Solid Snake with hearts around him. Oh yeah, yep. Yeah, that that would have been yeah. I was that that maybe still happens. Um, and it's actually. a really good GTA fan fiction. I, I vaguely remember. Oh and yeah. Being really yeah, really that, impressed. That was actually that was actually something I guess was originally on my blog that they republished. The site was like a year old. Like they didn't even have the community section then. It was just us. And um, I don't I don't even remember if I got paid. Like that's how new the site was. Um, but yeah, it would have been something that was republished from my original blog um, about how I played Vice City and, and I chased a, I chased a, um, a sex worker down in the rain and uh, fulfilled the stereotypical obligation of beating her to uh, reaccumulate the wealth that I had expended on her behalf. So that happened. <laughs> what motivated you back then uh, to write about these things? Well, where did the um, drive I from? didn't want a real job. <laughs> Um, no, I, I, uh, about games in general or about the specific things that I liked? Sure, games in general, I suppose, because it was a weird time. It's still a weird time, but it was weird then in terms of people didn't know if this was a real job and if people could get paid for doing it and, and, and people were doing it for no money, like it sounds like you might have. Yeah, everyone but, did uh, at first. Um, I did not know it was a real job, but... Um, I lived in New York City. I had gone to acting school. I did not want to get a real job, and I, the bleak prospect of fulfilling a career as an actress and lining up for furniture commercials was looming before me. And um, I was working in offices, and I was working as a nanny, and I was working as an administrative assistant at marketing firms and things like that. And I kind of just had this, I really can't live like this revelation, and I had to kind of scrape around in the bottom of my emotional bag of holding and say, you know, oh my god, what else am I good at? What else do I know anything about? And I came up with, I can write, and I uh, I know video games. Um, so from there I thought, you know, there was already so much video game writing being done. And uh, to be frank, when I started writing about video games, A, I didn't read much video games writing. I didn't, hadn't subscribed to those magazines since I was a kid because they seemed like they were for kids. And um, yeah, I just... If anyone had told me how impossible it is to become a games journalist for a living, I would not have. Like, I was mercifully removed from the games writing community because if I had known, you know, what it was like, how hard it was, and, and all of this, I, uh, I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't have done it. But what I did know was that the kind of things that I wanted to read were not being written. Um, I wanted, 
you know, I played, I didn't play popular games, I played weird games, and I played sex games, and I was really fascinated by them from a psychological way, you know, from a psychological perspective, and I thought, I would write the, I would try my hand at writing the type of stuff that I'd want to read, and most of it was kind of rambling and mental and useless, but people, it did resonate for people. Absolutely, um, I remember Colette Bennett, uh, funny you would mention her. Yeah, she, Colette uh, and I are you, still really good friends, she's a great lady. She looked up to you so much. At least that's what she was telling me. She like, oh, I she's like, she's like, she's very kind. In fact, did. yeah, Colette's very kind. In fact, it was she who uh, drove some of the early traffic to my blog with her recommendations on Destructoid, which had like what, like two hundred thousand people back then. It was a big number. <laughs> <laughs> and then from there, you moved to I, I think I know your career. Then you went to Kotaku. Is that right? No, or did you go to I, Kama Sutra um, and then Kotaku? Oh, who, oh, who's that in the background? Is that Conrad? I don't know. Maybe I don't hear anything. Oh, oh. Well, I heard someone that uh, seems to know my trajectory pretty well. Um, yeah, I I got hired. I, I was doing columns at Game Sit Watch, and um, I got hired at Gamma Sutra. Um, my boss Simon Carlos, who owns Game Sit Watch, you know, I was doing these weird sex games. Like this is an example of what a weird time it was for game journalism. I was doing my hentai game columns and my like perverted horror game columns, and he, uh, Simon Carlos, one day pinged me on IM and was like, you know, you're in New York, right? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'm in New York. And he said, you want to cover games for change? It's a conference about games for social good. And I said, you know, I don't know anything about that. He's like, give it a shot. <laughs> so I went, and I attended the event, and at the end of the day, I turned in a feature, including interviews and quotes and I uh, I guess that doesn't I mean that still doesn't happen that often but I I guess I had a go getter spirit um, so I ended up I ended up getting hired there to sort of help with really boring industry news like what shaders were now being released and what you know I don't know what uh, you know, UI tools were you know updates to this uh, user interface. Uh, you know, utility. So, like, product news and things like that, and I carried on doing my game set watch column, and I carried on writing for Destructoid a bit, I think. And, um, yeah, then Simon asked me if I wanted to head up um, our company's virtual worlds coverage, because 2008 was coming, 2007, 2008, like, the mainstream magazines were getting interested in Second Life and avatar-based social interaction. And again, I said, I don't know anything about that. And he said, that's okay, nobody does. And again, I, you know, I was able to learn, and I, uh, I covered the space pretty closely, and I ended up um, running GDC's Worlds in Motion Summit around the site that I had started, and uh, inviting people like Raf Koster to come talk about, um, you know, game design and avatar-led social spaces. So, I did that, and then I went to Kotaku after that because I wanted to do more mainstream games work, and that desire lasted me about four months <laughs> before I went back to Kama Sutra for a while. Um, Do you feel like at uh, that point you were on an upward um, upward projection and you wanted to see how far you could get in terms of reaching a visibility, larger audience? Yeah, yeah, yeah. visibility. Um, I, uh, I went to E3 with Kotaku, which was like the most, and this, was, this would have been 2008, would have been like the most enlightening crucible of my career. Brian Crescenti was still in charge of Kotaku and, and uh, we had they, Kotaku at the time had a mandate, I think, of many more posts today than it does now. I'm not exactly sure, but um, it is, it is, it was, and remains a grueling workload. Like people say a lot of things about Kotaku, but very few people could do it. Um, I don't know that I could have carried on doing it in the long term. I wasn't, you know, I didn't have the stamina um, for it. Um, yeah, and so when um, actually Brandon Boyer, who now runs Venus Patrol, and he's kind of like the indie ambassador to the world. He used to be the news director of Gama Sutra. And when oh. he when he left Gama Sutra to specialize in indie game developers, I was offered um, the job that he used to have. So um, I became news director of Gama Sutra, which I was for a couple of years until I went freelance, which is what I've been doing since. What an intense career it's been. And yeah, you've been able to... Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. People ask what, what... me who I write for, and I say everyone, because I've been very lucky. Um, I... Yeah, I've been very lucky. I've I've gotten to write about the games industry from a number of different angles and in a number of different places. I can't imagine this is interesting to anyone to hear about my my. Uh... No, I don't. I don't think so. I think it's very interesting <laughs> to think about someone who had planned on maybe being an actress because you enjoyed 
expressing yourself, putting yourself out there, taking those risks, putting mm. your ideas into people's heads, and then suddenly taking this uh, divergent shift into writing about video games, which was like, what? what? What does that even mean? You write for Nintendo Power? You like yeah. you up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right for a job? That's such a... Um, and then to, to help the industry grow without intending to, I'm sure, but you're a lot of people's... Uh, role model. I've heard that for years and years and years. Weird to hear that. Yeah, I, but it's absolutely very, true. That's very touching and very strange. Um, I attract a lot of noise in the position of, I, I am in, uh, where I'm so visible and I'm so vocal now, and um, I've become prolific enough, you know, that there's a high signal to noise ratio, and I have had to sort of train myself not to really think about the feedback that much because mm. everyone will say something, especially in the Twitter age. Twitter makes me crazy, um, mm. as anyone who follows me can probably tell. <laughs> but if people have been um, positively affected by what I've done, I'm really grateful for that and, and happy about it. Well, I'll, t- I'll tell you how I see you because that's fun. That's a Oh, no. I'm, I'm, yeah. can, can I have some of my wine before you do that? <laughs> Absolutely you can. <laughs> this is a drinking, swearing, whatever you want kind of show. So I see video games as kind of being like three lanes of traffic right now. And we've got the traditional kind of escapist fantasy lane. Then in the middle, we have sort of a, a new age of just looking at the form of video games and people trying to figure out what they can do with that form for the sake mm-hmm. of the as, as an expressive art. Yeah, well, well, that's actually my third lane. The middle lane is just like, what can we do with these things? Like, uh, Adam Atomic's game Hundreds, which came out not that long ago. Hundreds so is so sexy. It really I know, is. isn't it? So beautifully designed, so simple, but it's not about expressing an idea so much as, like, can you believe how far we extrapolated on the simple design? So we've got them in the middle, and then on the, on the right, we've got people who are like, what can video games actually do in terms of saying something about being alive and being a human being and what we did. Are they an art form that people are inhabiting consciously and using it to say things? Exactly. And I see a lot of crashing into those lanes because everyone's trying to head the same place, which is better video games, but because... Does everyone really want better video games? Because you say that, but anyone who gave GTA anything less than a perfect score got death threats. So, like, we're not allowed... I don't believe that anyone... (laughs) who is willing to crucify someone for criticism wants better video games. I I don't actually believe that everyone wants better video games. There is a huge contingency of the consumer audience that whenever the conversation comes up, you know, they they believe that the company is contractually obligated to provide them a good video game. Um, They believe that they're going to get their, they should get their value for their dollar and they expect, you know, an installment to be bigger than the one before. But I don't know if they're interested in the vocabulary of what quantifies better. Um, Mm. I think they want to be able to sort of enjoy an annual up to ante as if they were watching team sports. That this, they hope this season is better than the last. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, yeah, I don't believe that everyone wants better video games. I think some people really, and and uh, to be fair, the same can be said about a lot of people I grew up with who love Zelda and love JRPGs, and they just want another Zelda. Mm-hmm. They want another Chrono Trigger. You know, some people don't want a better thing; they want more of the same, and that's that's a valid wish. But um, I think your traffic analogy is really apt in that, you know, we used to all be on the same road, and now we're sort of stratifying into, um, you know, a bunch of different vertexes of the form where people want, people may want different things and not realize it yet because we all assume we're going to the same place and we may not be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I had never thought of it that way. Jeez, you're smart. I'm enjoying this. Thank you. Yeah, fun. Uh, You managed to talk about GTA V in a pretty biting way. I did, Without, I did a couple of things, yeah. yeah. You did. And uh, people who loved GTA V, some of uh, the employees of Destructo had actually, Jim Sterling, loves GTA V. Yeah. And he also loved your uh, initial before you'd really even played My it. My parody review. Uh-huh. He yeah. ate that up. He was uh, singing his praises up and down. Which that was I very thought, nice of him. Um, well, it, he wouldn't do it if he didn't mean it. He's He certainly doesn't. He's not nice on purpose. <laughs> yeah, no, he, he's an opinionated man who uh, is not known for handing out kittens unnecessarily. Um, I've known Jim for a long time. Um, Jim was uh, at Destructoid at the time that I started, and we butt, butted heads quite a lot um, on our uh, attitudes toward uh, what our responsibility was, which I think is still a valid conversation that a lot of people are having. Um, but I think um, 
for Gemini, the space is populous enough now, and there are a var wide variety of people um, with different stances that I think we can respect that there's room for one another's differing approaches. And also we've come to appreciate one another's you know, work more, um, that he, as he's become so sh more socially aware and more conscientious, he's gotten funnier. And mm -hmm. as he's become more uh, socially conscious, he's appreciated the fight that I've been doing more. So we were kind of much more on the same page. Oh, but um, yeah, my GTA parody. I like GTA. I'm a big fan of the series. You cannot, you can't talk about something and you can't spend words on something unless you love it. Um, you can't, you know, I wouldn't wait, if I didn't think it was an enormous and important asteroid on the surface of the world of games, I wouldn't waste any time on it. I'm still playing it. You know, we're playing the hell out of GTA 5 here. It's not, it's not to say that it isn't worthy of playing or isn't worthy of consideration. I think that the juggernaut around it deserves even more scrutiny as a result of how big it is. I think that we have even more leisure to take swings at it because it's the biggest guy on the playground, you know? Um, if we can test our ability to be good critics out against anything, why not a game that, I can't, I could give it the worst review in the world, it's gonna make two billion dollars. So why don't we, you know, take the opportunity to genuinely be critical? They have the resources to do better. They have the resources to be smarter. We should demand that they do it. Um, you know, it's not like we're picking on a little guy here. Um, which is another weird thing I want to ask you about gamers, like their tendency to, if you've encountered that tendency for them to really studiously defend big corporations. Um, oh, absolutely. When, yeah. It's, yeah, I guess uh, I'll take a tangent. It's really strange how, you know, Microsoft or PS4 or GTA, it's the big guns on the landscape that get fans really heated. Mm -hmm. And it's like, didn't we all kind of start playing video games because we were little guys, right? Like, didn't we not really have a place to go or we were picked on or we're geeks or whatever? And it's sort of like now we're really rallying around the captain of the football team to make sure no one makes fun of him. Um, it's a weird, it's a weird, being so anti-consumer is a weird thing for me to see gamers defend. Um, and that's what my parody review was sort of trying to take the piss out of a little bit, was, you know, yeah, I wrote the parody of the review before I had played the game, and it was more to make a statement of the fact that you could sort of mock the process of celebrating and reviewing these giant corporate creations, whether you played them or not. Um, and the environment around the reviews discussion, particularly with Carolyn's review at GameSpot, it was so dark and so mm -hmm. ugly. And I just wanted to have a laugh um, at the idea that there's anything to say about games in a review. You know what I mean? Yeah, absolutely. I and it, it was so effective, I thought. Sorry, I rambled that... so much. But... Oh, no, it was great. I was chewing on every word. Uh, the fact that the way you went about it, and I think people should really look at what you did and the way you went about saying what you said, uh, I look to your work to, to try to find ways to talk about things that may be threatening to people, maybe uh, uh, kind of attack the egos unintentionally of the little guy you described earlier who is now attached to uh, defending the, the captain of the football team because that makes them feel puffed up and big. Yeah, why do we people? Why do we feel like we need to be Microsoft's yes men? You know? Well, it makes them feel better about themselves, I, I, I think. Not always, but oftentimes... When you're sick of feeling small and you align yourself with, you know, you're from New York. You're, I used I'm to sure be a know. Yankees fan. I was the hugest exactly. Yankees fan. All and, the and players I like are. I'm sorry, go ahead. I say all the players I like have basically retired now, but I can definitely relate to that feeling. I loved to, I loved to be a Yankees fan because they were the big guns. Right, and and if anyone ever attacked the the Yankees, you would defend them like you probably would defend a little kitten, even though they um, were. No, I was probably, I mean, I was, you know, decidedly pretty internet-trollish about it. So it's actually a good analogy. If I can't understand why people are hateful and pro-corporate, I just have to think of how I acted during baseball season. <laughs> <laughs> I think it might be some of the, uh, some similar psychology, but you managed to attack, well, attack's the wrong word, and that's exactly my point. You managed to say something about the way people write video game reviews and... I think attack is okay in this conflict. You know, we can't overuse attack because people will hear any kind of criticism or any kind of constructive conversation as attack if they're not mm. being agreed with. Um, mm. In this case, it was probably an attack, though. I'm, I'm okay with that terminology. Huh. I didn't take it as one, and that was my guess as to why it went over so well with people 
who had already decided they loved GTA. At least it, it didn't seem to be an attack on GTA or the people. No, it wasn't about GTA. I think that's why it re was received so well, because we want to say that we can love this game and be really into it and still hate the climate around it, still hate the reviews conversation, still hate the hype cycle, and still hate the way the community acts. At G like, it, you know... The joke. The joke was not at the expense of GTA. It was like at our own expense. And I think, for all of us who were tired of the environment of darkness and hate speech and whatever that usually precedes the launch of a game like that, that we could kind of make the process small and make it something that we could laugh at. I think that I, I like to think that that's why people liked it, um, because it wasn't about the game. And that's the point. Reviews and games culture are often not about the game anymore. Neither neither was the response to the reviews about GTA. You know, neither was the way Carolyn got treated at her own website um, about GTA. It's about problems in games culture, which is is what I was trying to satirize with the parody. Absolutely, and, and in a way that hopefully spoke to the fact that we're all sick of people who are ingenuine or people who value things about games. Well, to me, the review really felt like this is what a reviewer would write if they wanted to write a review that people would definitely like. If you wanted to yes. write a crowd-pleasing crowd, crowd -pleasing review uh, and you hadn't even played the game, you could do that. And you yeah. could get people saying, you're my favorite reviewer now because you like the thing I think I will like that hasn't come out yet. Yeah, and the score I put on it at the end was like 9.7 out of 10. Like, what does that mean, 9.7 out of 10? And I even got sincere feedback. There were a lot of people who thought it was real. Mm. And he wrote to me being like, you know, I liked your review. It echoed many of my same thoughts. Um, I don't like the thing you said about misogyny. Is that why you took off the point, the extra point three? I'm like, no, you're the point of this joke. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, and I got a lot. I got like hate mail about it because I said the word misogyny, and people didn't realize, you know, people didn't realize why I did that. Um, in part because I, I kind of had this idea that I knew if I said the M word, I'd get a lot of trolls and I could sort of collate some of my favorite responses. Um, but after the response to the review had been so positive and so many, it resonated for so many people, and for a lot of people said they felt like it was like a breath of fresh air in this kind of dark cultural washing machine that we had all been in. Um, I didn't want to, you know, I felt like we had won, and I didn't want to turn it into some negative, like, troll shaming thing, so I didn't end up doing that, but... Yeah, it it almost felt like a review of GTA I might read in GTA. If GTA yeah, were, well, that's what a lot written. of people said. They were like, did you hear it got songified? Um, Jonathan Mann made a song. Yes, I did. I uh, I posted that, I hope, in this in this post. I did the link to that. Though I think okay. it's been songified a few times. Oh, no, I didn't do the songified one. I just did the one with, like, the kind of nice jazz in the background. Yeah, that was the one that I, I made. I just did it in one take. I, I had a song on, and I just went up and did it, and it all seemed to click really well. But I'm... Jonathan Mann, who's, who does Song a Day on YouTube, uh, made a song version of it, and uh, it was just so merry and sweet, and um, yeah, it made me feel really nice. Um, he worked for Destructoid really 2 at one point. I think he did. did he? Yeah, I think so. I don't think he wrote, but I think he did songs on Destructoid for a good six months. Oh, Back maybe. when he was Game Jew, wasn't he called Game Jew for a while? Oh gosh, I don't remember. I, was, I don't think I was there then. Huh, I'll have to look into it. Oh, uh, me and my life yeah. research. Uh, and then after that, you wrote a uh, actual piece about your experience with GTA, and yeah. it spoke a lot about you, I think, and and people of our uh, level of time with video games. Yeah. I, I, it wasn't the review of, like, someone who'd been playing video games for a couple years. Right. It felt like someone who'd been playing them for a while and how a game like GTA V might make them feel. And I hope that didn't garner any hate mail because it was so even and and not... It was just about as much about you as the game, so I would hope people wouldn't feel... No, I mean, there's always... It. You know, when you talk about any popular game, it's always going to be really controversial. Um, the interesting thing about game reviewers, and, and like you said, it... You said my piece didn't, you know, it read, it read like someone who's been in games for a while. Most people who have been in games for a while don't write reviews anymore. Um, we don't like doing it. Nobody likes putting numbers on things. Nobody likes the fan pressure. Nobody likes the fallacy that you can be objective about a game and not bring your own experience into it. Nobody likes having to crunch a game in 24 hours and still have to act like that's how everyone else is going to approach it. Um, 
So I feel like as soon as we, any writer has the ability to do something other than reviews, most of them accept it and they stop writing reviews and they stop doing it. So most reviews are probably written by people who, you know, and there are exceptions. There are a lot of long-term reviewers who, you know, do the, do the to God's work or whatever, um, do really hard work um, working in the Metacritic system. Um, but I think the vast majority of scores are contributed to, by people who haven't been doing this for a long time, which is just interesting for me. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, I, uh, I wrote a critique, um, and I chose to take a personal angle, but I think the point I was trying to make was that so you have the you have the fifth you you have the fifth you know console GTA or you know GTA five is the sixth one I don't know um, seventh I think maybe seventh seven. yeah are, are we counting mm. mobile ones in China I don't it, it's been a lot of them Liberty time. City stories I don't know so it's basically the GTA franchise has existed for over ten years now and every time it makes a lot of money and it's huge and um you know. Rockstar can basically probably write their own paychecks. They're keeping their publisher in business single-handedly, pretty well, not single-handedly, but you know they're they yeah, are they're like three atlases worth of just GTA Five. I think made something like three or four times as much atlas as worth as an entire company. So Jeez, got that. Yeah. yeah, I mean, what do you do if you're those? What do you do if you're the Hauser brothers? Every year, mainstream magazines interview you about how you're the future of entertainment, and you're in the New Yorker talking about how we're almost like film, like it's so close, like it's going to be real, you know. How do you, you have everything now, you you have all the money, you have all the resources, how do you top that? Where's the hunger, where's the scrappiness? Like, one thing I keep coming back to is how rebellious and meaningful and scrappy GTA felt for me in the post-Columbine and the post-9-11 time when everyone was blaming moral panic on video games. And here was a video game that was like, huh, no, you know, like, I loved it. I got a lot out of it. I found it to be very intelligent satire for the time. But now it's, it's like still telling the same jokes, and it's not working for me anymore. And I find it interesting that, you know, you play, let's say you play Michael in GTA V, and uh, he's a guy who climbed all the way to the top, and it didn't buy him happiness, and he's losing his family, and he starts the game with a nice car. Remember when like stealing a nice car in GTA used to mean something? It used to feel like a victory? But now here's this guy, he can't hold on to his family, he already has money, and he goes back to these repetitive, cheesy, you know, 80s movie gangster heist, because it's all he knows how to do, and because he doesn't have any other outlet for his anger problems. And I almost wonder if there's, if there's an analog for the creation of the game in that. You know, like, what do you do now that you're a billionaire? You got nothing else to say, you know? Like... That's, that was really sad for me about GTA V. It's like, you used to be our rebels. And it's like watching punk rockers turn 55. It's just, it's depressing. And it, of course the game is still huge and there's so much to do. And I'm really enjoying playing it, you know, on a you know, shallow level. It's not changing my life and it's definitely not changing the world. And I think it's definitely not what the creators want to do with the franchise. They, I, like, I think that they would like to change the world if they could. I think they want to revolutionize games and entertainment to hear them talk. And they're just mm -hmm. making another mean, like, bullying women simulator. It's like, you know, I didn't, I was never, you know, I, I was never bothered by the misogyny in GTA before. Mm -hmm. um, when people, you know, and I, and here's an interesting thing. If you're a woman and you criticize GTA, I got a lot of mail about how I'm a sensitive, offended feminist. Um, never once did I say that I needed to play as a woman in the game. Um, never once did I say that I was upset or offended or any of these things. Um, I think it's just sort of lazy because it's the same joke again. It's the same character again, except with less power and getting older and looking even more pathetic. Like, you know, when you're a young up-and-coming gangster, okay, you can relate to that. Now you're like an old guy trying to be a young up-and-coming gangster. That's like a little sad. Um, and you could argue that the sadness is part of the message of the game. But if you have the opportunity to move your medium forward, why not tackle issues people haven't tackled before? You know, real meaningful satire. Everyone's like, it's satire, it's satire. Real satire punches upward. Real satire skewers the people in power. Um, it doesn't make jokes out of beating up women because that's just what lazy bullies do, you know? So it's like, I was never offended. I was just, like, super disappointed by it. Um, it's a horrible world where everyone's horrible. But then why not invent new ways to be horrible? Why not give me a, f a woman monster? You know, why not, you know, why not examine 
yourself instead of telling the same jokes. You know, I, I don't know I'm rambling, but that was what I, I wanted know. to get it get across yeah. the view. Absolutely, and and you did. I uh, years ago I wrote poorly a article about. It was after GTA 4 came out. I think we were doing a feature series on Destructoid about, like, how would you change a game in the future? And mm. I quickly wrote something and also did art for it because I like to draw. Um, the idea of a GTA about a prostitute, of a, a woman who is a prostitute who becomes a businesswoman and then becomes a president. Now, fun it would be to, like, draw on how her skill set, which is like working with people, working power situations, and lowering herself to things other people wouldn't necessarily do, could work to... And having to succeed in a, in a system that naturally oppresses her, where men are usually in charge and she's going to have to subvert that. Exactly, and making her a sympathetic character on that end, you can be like, we all know, hopefully we all know what it's like to feel like the world is against us and we have yeah. to. Uh, but on the other end, seeing her doing... You know, by the time she became a CEO, she would be, you know, dumping pollution in the river and just, like, destroying and just thinking, well, this is what I have to do to get ahead. Um, that's an interesting, yeah, that's, that is an interesting character arc. Like, I, I hope people are listening and they see that what you're not just trying to randomly switch genders out of it. I hate when people say political correctness, you know, like, mm -hmm. it's like, this would actually be new and interesting. This is actually something we haven't heard before. And it's actually something that's relevant to our times. Like, to me, GTA... Three was about the conversations we were having at the time. GTA Five is about the conversations we were. It was, it's Comedy Central 2004. It's it hasn't kept up, you know. <laughs> but when I when I had that idea at the time, people hated it. They were really? like, "Oh, play as a woman, terrible. Maybe as a cop. Maybe as a corrupt cop, that could be cool because you could." Oh God, you know, I've never played as a cop before. I've never I've never seen a cop corruption story. Oh my God, what if you could be like a mafia man? Did you did you ever think of that? You could be. Well, it's. Oh my God! No, you could listen, Holmes. You could be someone who wants revenge. Revenge. That games have never played with wanting revenge. See, like, I like. I, that's when you said you said you know we were talking about. I don't think everyone wants wants video games to change. I think that's an example of that. That even the idea of something new is actually threatening to them. And get upset about it. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Well, it's. I get the sense that a lot of people who like GTA. And I hope I don't offend anybody with this. It's just the sense I get. There Is are people. Is this so afraid to offend anybody because they're gonna just like go ape shit? Like, why are we? So... We're critics. We have to have opinions. Why are we so afraid that everyone's gonna get mad? Like, it's a weird environment to work in. I guess I'm afraid they're gonna stop listening as soon as they get mad, and that's when I get sad. Oh. It's like, oh, why don't I even say anything? Oh, I think I intelligent they... people engage with voices that sometimes challenge them. And um, if you, you put out a great show, you know, consistently and you have a loyal listener and you're always, like, a really positive person. So, you know, if, if you lose them, good. Like, they weren't part of your revolution, you know? <laughs> you should be on the show all the time, Lee Alexander. Yes, so, okay. <laughs> I was going to say that uh, a lot of people play GTA because it is a nice sadism simulator where they get to mm -hmm. live a side of... Well, it, it kind of speaks to America in general. I feel like in the United States, our culture is constantly telling us, like, be capitalist, step on the other guy, get mm. bigger and stronger, win the game, get the money. Yep. The be... American dream. Like, anyone yeah. can have whatever they want if they only try. Like, we all start from the same place. But when they try, they end up stepping on people on the way, and that's encouraged. Like, yeah, you should be like Donald Trump. He's amazing. He crushed so many people under his feet. So on one end, we have this message like, be sadistic and evil and get all the stuff, and that's mm. great. On the other end, we have this message like, but don't use the wrong swear words. Don't uh, look at boobs. Don't, yeah. uh, you know. So we, we're told to be considerate on the surface, but kind of uh, power Ruthless hungry. Ruthless inside. Yeah, and GTA speaks to that for a lot of people, where they get to be ruthless for a long time, but then also... It then feels more honest, definitely. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think we probably have a failure of messaging, because, you know, again, when I talk about women in Grand Theft Auto, or boobs in video games, it's not because boobs are bad. It's not because I'm offended about boobs. It's not because I think women mm -hmm. need to cover those suckers up. Like, if you want to take your boobs out, great. You know, it's that, you know... Every time a woman's breasts appear in video games, it's generally in a situation where a man is taking her power away. The boobs are not the problem. It's still that ruthless undercurrent that you're talking about. Take what you want, who cares? And women are often the victims of take what you want, who cares? That's why gamers are so, that's why we're so sensitive about rape right now. Um, 
so when we're talking about, you know, don't maybe let's take a break from certain kinds of jokes, or maybe let's think about the way we're representing female bodies in games. It's not censorship or be nice, or it's not. It's actually more of that domineering capitalist ruthlessness that creates gains for some people at the expense of others. And I think that's what, you know, I'm having a hard time kind of explaining to people because I absolutely agree that games should be and can be, some games can be incredibly meaningful outlets for violence. They can be ways for us to understand social evil. Being a sadist in a game is not wrong. It's only a game. I believe that. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that if we're going to ask, you know, if we're going to defend our right to look at our dark urges in games, you know, you don't get to have that unless you can also be grown up enough to be willing to have a conversation about the words you use and how you treat women and how you treat people less powerful than yourself in society, you know, and how, how you know, the judgments that you levy against others, you know, because those are evils you commit to. So it's like, it's one thing to say, like, oh, this is my outlet, you know, this is just how society is, but if you try to have a conversation with me about society, I'm going to accuse you of being politically correct. You know, that's an incredible hypocrisy that takes place around games culture right now. Like, I want this conversation to be more inclusive and more intelligent. I'm not trying to shut anyone up or censor them. I'm like, let's talk about how you think about women. You know, let's talk about how you think about bodies. Let's talk about how you think about gender. If you want to have a completely un unexamined right to mow down people with cars and guns, at least be grown up enough to talk about the other parts of society. I don't know if that makes sense, but... It totally makes sense, and I'm always instantly depressed when I bring up something like uh, recently on Podtoid, on the new Podtoid that you are not on, where Jim Sterling talks about having sex with me every week. I don't know if yeah, you didn't that. you mention that you were kind of uncomfortable with that? No, no, no. It's totally fine. Okay. I get uncomfortable when people say they are going to sexually assault me okay. at events, because I don't want that to happen, or no, stab me. That's not me. a funny joke. <laughs> no, but they, they, they feel so empowered by the idea that they can jokingly attack a middle-aged looking man not as and they think I, they're joking but you know if you and then if you say ha actually guys I, I don't think this is funny they're encouraged by your protests and they keep doing mm -hmm. it absolutely um, this is a situation where a mob is like you know, they may view you as powerful because you're on a you know you're on a show and you work for a game site and they don't and they want what you have but I don't think that you know making joke threats about your body is like a good way for them to take their power back. Me neither. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I just, if, if anyone's listening right now, I don't think it's cool to talk to him that way. It's not mature and it's not respectful. But And, and then people are like, it's just a joke. We're talking about games. There's more important things in the world. You need to lighten up. And it's like, I mean, we... I could, yeah, of course, yes. We're talking about games, but... You're going to actually threaten people's lives over video games. You better make sure they're hella important. You know, if you're going to threaten to bodily violate people over video games, these have to be important and impactful things. Otherwise, you're making an ass out of yourself over nothing. Like, let's at least have the wherewithal to ask for more from our entertainment if we're going to act like this about it. Like, if you're going to be an obsessive, at least make sure you're defending the right things. There's so many different directions I could go with this. Rats! I feel, like I, keep, I feel like I'm talking too much. So No, was... you're talking just enough. I love it. But I I'm, I feel like I'm in one of those not that well written um, games about making moral choices and I, I want to take every so choice have, at like, the same time. It's at the bottom of the screen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and like uh, X or Y and I'll, I'll, you'll get points uh, with this interview if you pick the right answer. I'll get points in my brain for wanting to, because, you know, we don't... Uh, Stop Holmes as designed by David Cage and Bioware. <laughs> and I'll have to replay the whole game in order to take the other uh, path at some point. Yeah, so I'll have exactly. to be on the yep. show again at that point. And the, uh, and won't, there, there's still only two endings, even though there's a lot of choices. It's like Walking Dead up in here. <laughs> I love Walking Dead. I'm, see, like now we can make jokes about things we love without anyone getting mad, right? Like, if you love no. something, it's okay to joke about it. If you hate something, you should probably examine yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it depends on how you go about making that joke, of course. But I was going to say, well, what was I going to say? I guess the, the best choice is to bring up this whole... Ah, oh, rats, how do I word it? Hmm, I'm really stumped. When you want something too bad, I don't know if that happens to you when you play these uh, choose-your-next-text-box games. I, I can sit there and stare at them for a long time. Really Choice-driven games. Yeah. That, yeah. Is that what they're called? I don't know. I mean, they they make a whole they make a lot about player choice and 
player-directed narrative. Um, but I find them pretty confining. They're not really my favorites. Yeah, I've been hoping to see Twine continue to explode. Yeah. So we can see more different types of those branching path games that aren't necessarily just about um, leading someone to shoot some more guys in a different way. Yeah. yeah. Um, the Twine games I like, you know, it's possible to make to use Twine to make a real, like, choose-your-own-adventure style experience. But people are actually doing incredibly sophisticated things with Twine right now, and they have a community where they develop and implement and share macros. And the result is games that can, like Porpentine's game, um, her newest game is um, Ultra Business Tycoon 3. And even though it's only delivered in text, it really, for me, creates a sense of place. And I have a map that forms in my head. Like, it's not a choose-your-own-adventure story. She's rendering a world out of words. And um, you pick up objects, and the game knows you have them. And uh, they're, they're, they're getting really interesting. I think just because text is the medium of delivery, we don't have to relegate Twine to being about like choice and storytelling. There are people that are actually um, summoning entire universes into being using words. I mean, I don't know how to make games. I know how to write. So if I could make a game by writing, as long as it was a game, that would be fun, you know? Yeah, I'd like to see you. Have you thought about doing that? I've done, I've done some. Um, most of them have been parody um, games. If you go to my website, leealexander.net, and uh, I think it's under MISC, miscellaneous, um, there are a list of, of the few games that I've made. And other of the, others of them are just, like, little private gifts for friends and people that I care about, like, based on in-jokes, just a thing, you know. And that's, the, that's kind of the beauty part of Twine, is that it enables someone in an afternoon to give a game to someone else that they made, like a greeting card. And it's increasing the ways that we can use games in society to get along and be close to each other. Like, what if I just made you a game to thank you for having me on the show? That's more games. I'm making a game. You're playing a game. Even if we're not gamers, we can enjoy that interaction. Um, and it lowers the gatekeeping and the cost of participation, and you don't have to be a gamer to, like, make a Twine game, you know? Absolutely. And there are people that are enraged by that. It comes back to this threat yeah. that opening the gates... Uh, people feel an inherent sort of like detraction of their own importance by the fact that they're involved with this medium that they know is very closed off. Uh, I've uh, been doing headcounts lately, and it's going to, again, make people mad and, and shut them down from listening to what I'm saying, but I've been doing headcounts at, at things I've been going to. I went to the Boston Festival of Indie Games about that long ago, two weeks ago. Oh, and even I spoke though... there last year. Oh, did you? Yeah, oh, I gave the keynote last year. They're a great group. Yeah, I was there, but I missed the keynote. Right? Uh, they are a great. That, group. I, I was. That was last year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I missed the. I was there last year too, but I missed. Oh, I the, see. Uh, Fine. Show. I see you didn't come to my talk. <laughs> um, how long Sorry, are we gonna be? I think I might have to go. Um, oh, no. okay. No, that was a joke. <laughs> um, I believed you. My heart sank, but I was like, okay, Lee. I'm a, I'm a really mm -hmm. uh, a great humorist, if if you hadn't noticed. Um, so I'm sorry. Well, you were at the Boston Festival of Indie Games, and you did a headcount. Yeah, and it's still. It's still a certain demographic for the most part. You know, it was probably like one in ten uh, people there were women. There was maybe like a couple of people were Caucasian there. It's still very much that audience, and I, I get a sense of why that is because. Well, keep in mind were, you're in Boston, which is uh, in Cambridge. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah I'm from there, and it's like. The diversity ratio in, you know, Boston is very race and class stratified. Mm -hmm. um, I was at Eurogamer this past weekend, and I thought that it was pretty diverse. Um, really? Um, more than E3 or more than games events that I had been to in recent years. I mean, granted, there's still a lot of young white dudes, but um, there were older people as well. There were adults. There were, fam you know, families, and there were people of color. And, you know, I met a, a lot of other women. I think, I do think the demographics are changing. Like, maybe something hardcore like E3 and something set in the Northeast would not be the best place to observe mm. um, that diversification happening. But it's happening. It really is. It just depends what sectors of the market you look at. Mm -hmm. Well, I, generally, it's it's Boston events, PAX, and E3 for me. And I haven't felt like I've seen much change, but maybe, I don't know, I could be... Yeah, I mean, I don't go to PAX, um, but E3 never changes. E3 is a horrible cultural desert. E3 is the worst. Oh, I, I'm never, I'm not going, I've actually just, I've told my employers that I don't want to cover E3 anymore. And um, I don't think I need to because I'm not as, I, I, don't, I'm, I don't work for a retail publication, so I don't need to tell people what they should buy based on five minutes of seeing it. Um, so yeah, I, I, uh, I don't do the E3 thing. 
Um, and it's really hostile and nasty there, and I never liked it um, mm -hmm. ever. And it just has, it's actually gotten worse um, for me, E3 has. Really? Yeah. Sorry but, to yeah, no, it's okay. I don't have to go. <laughs> I can make my living and never set foot at E3. Yeah. A lot um, of people but, are saying that. Yeah. But there are more events. Um, there are more diverse events. There are more, you know, I went to the um, I went to different games in New York, which was I think last fall, and it was like really focused, you know, minority focused, and and uh, focused on making games accessible to um, you know for for people with um, ability issues or people with, you know queer people, people of color, and and it was focused on being welcoming to people who might not have historically felt welcome by games before, and you're seeing more and more events that are trying to address. Um, people who haven't felt that games are traditionally for them, whether those are 48-hour game jams or, you know, fan conferences with a commitment to inclusivity and non-harassment. Like, it's changing. It is. I think it is. Um, it depends on what vertex of the market you operate in. There are some places that are still very much the same and very resistant to change, as you said. Um, but alternatives are appearing, and, and they're appearing quickly. And if we can't participate in the traditional games industry, we'll make a new one. That's basically what's happening. And do you think that there's a chance for these different lanes of traffic? Because that's definitely one lane. For them to somehow converge, do you think, do you, do you envision Sony or Microsoft uh, as and Nintendo, they've kind of jumped on the idea that there's this romantic notion to indie games lately. And we see Sony... Well, there, it's not a romantic notion for them. It's a business necessity that sure. Sony is actually winning the console perception war by courting indies should tell you how powerful that sector of the market has gotten. Um, even though people are like, ah, oh, no one cares about indie games. I only care about Call of Duty and GTA. So I'm like, yeah, that's just you, bro. Like, their whole business strategy depends on us now, like, depends on catering to indies. And I think, you know, I don't know if you'll ever see fringe titles or twine games on console platforms, but you never know. Um, I do think, yes, there's an opportunity for those things to converge. Like, I'm playing GTA and I also play twine games. I can't be the only person in the world who does that, you know? Um, and ideally I won't be, as if if the, the writing I do tries to tries to include more people in the conversation about the things that I like, you know, like, if I write articles about GTA 5 that are hopefully challenging, ideally the end result is that people who don't generally play video games and who just read The Guardian will be motivated and curious to find out about what we do. So, yes, I absolutely think there's a possibility for the convergence that you're hoping for. Um, it's already happening. And... It's just, it's like a buffet that's added 10 more tables. You're going to, mm. even if you don't eat everything, you're going to be, you know, content. A nice idea. I love buffets. Me too. <laughs> Especially all you can eat buffets that have, you know, I just go to the Crab Rangoons again and again. <laughs> oh, I'm telling you, they, do, they don't have good Chinese food in London. I've not had good Chinese food since I've been here. Um, <sighs> I, that's too yeah, bad. I can't wait to go back to New York and go to a buffet and binge eat at it. So. <laughs> I went to a buffet recently, a Chinese buffet, that had stuffed clams, two different kinds of french fries, oh my mashed God. potatoes, apple pie, apple uh, pie, tacos. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I love the buffets that are like just every kind of cuisine that they can fit on the buffet table. And it almost like a third of it was good. And I tried everything, so I know. I yeah, I think the weird thing about being in England is that they have like real bread and real cheese. So that means it's, like, really impossible for me to get nachos. There's no melty orange cheese here. I've not found melty fake cheese. Like, I didn't realize how much I loved fake cheese until I left America. And um, we did find, we found one restaurant in Greenwich um, where, near where I live, and it was, like, it was sort of like chilies, like, with the blue margaritas and the cactuses hanging from the ceiling, and I was like, we're going in here. And, yeah, anyway, I you made me homesick for buffets. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I wonder how an America town would do in, in London if they just uh, had... Probably not so well. Um, hmm. Most other places that aren't America don't think America is that cool. <laughs> <laughs> That's an absolute fact. Um, I speaking think of that, we, we think we're a lot cooler than the rest of the world thinks we are. Yeah, we are that kid, aren't we? Who's wearing yeah. a trucker hat and he's like sure that he's on top of new trends because that was funny. Yeah, when he's on stage at the Xbox movie. presentation right now, that guy. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of other cultures, I've been thinking a lot about um, why it is that games like Grand Theft Auto just don't seem to click in Japan. And Japan is uh, a very strict culture 
it's a very regimented culture from what I know. Um, so I would imagine there'd be this kind of um, popping a collective pimple of repression for people to like, oh, I finally get to commit the crimes in Japan, but they, it's Monster Hunter over there. People just want to hit a dinosaur with a club. And, so and I, I've not been to Japan, and nor am I a you know, particular uh, specialist on international cultural studies. So, you know, I hear the same things everyone... You know, I think that uh, the reality of what Japan is like is probably different than what we... Uh, sort of uh, synthesized by reading and watching anime, so I can't really talk about what motivates Japanese players, but um, I used to, when I used to write about hentai games and about sex games, um, I was often told by people that the uh, you know, boundary crossing and the taboo and the transgression and the, and, and the violating element of those games was a response to cultural repression. Um, but again, not how, I, I can't really comment on how repressed the Japanese are or are not because I don't know. Um, sure. I think, in general, um, Western games aren't popular in Japan. Um, I don't know many major Western franchises that sell well in Japan. Um, that could be because of nationalism. That could be because the Japanese market has a different... Oh, look at your cat. Oh, did she show up? She's yeah. pretty nice. Hi, Dinka. So pretty. What's yeah, the cat's name? Pretty. Her name is Dinka Katinka, and she oh. is part my doll. I wonder if I can get her. She is so cute. Sorry, I'm sorry. Hi, Kitty. Sorry, I'm sorry. I want to look at your cat while I'm back on this subject. Oh, sure. Um, I think um, sales results would suggest that the Japanese market prefers a different aesthetic. Um, mm. We find that Japanese players tend to prefer third-person games but with fantasy elements and that the games that sell well in Japan don't simulate reality strongly. Um, I mean, with the exception of the Persona series where the fact that it was a JRPG where you really went to school was kind of like a hook. Versus, mm. you know, But again, it was also about like weird Freudian nightmares and saving people from themselves through the use of you know, really grotesque uh, inner, inner self avatars, so I don't think you could say Persona is realistic to, necessarily. Um, but yeah, I think just, I can't really, um, beyond generalizing, I can't articulate how the Japanese appetite is different from ours. Um, but it's different, so what probably feels uh, cathartic and transgressive to a Western audience might not feel that way to a Japanese audience, is, is the only uh, hypothesis I can make. Well, that's awfully smart, and also measured. Yeah. yeah I should be so smart and measured. I'm going to let her go. She's oh, purring. bye, Kitty. To do. She'll probably be back. I uh, hope so. I'm, I, but I'm puzzled that, you know, Gra uh, Metal Gear does very well in Japan. Uh, Resident Evil, it seems like if you take out the actually killing a person, you can get fairly realistic with Japanese games and, and do pretty well. Um, yeah. Whereas if you do that in the United States, if you take out the killing a guy, um, oftentimes... Uh, it doesn't it's matter less if it's realistic or not. Western people, people want it. You know, and... Again, I, d I have tried a lot to study what makes people play things and what it says about our appetites that we like certain things. And I find it much harder to pin down than the idea that um, we're sort of socialized to prefer certain things. Um, mm. We are told, to, to a strong extent, we're told what we like by marketers and advertisers. Um, the way that an adolescent boy in Japan is marketed to and the products that are um, intent, you know, an adolescent in Japan, um, it's de very different than the values that we're given through our advertising industry. So I think to an extent we buy what we're told we're supposed to like and we just get different messages than um, kids in Japan do just because, you know, our our industries are different, our businesses are different, what we're good at, you know, um, in terms of, you know, production and manufacturing are probably different. Um, so we're not being, we're not being given the same messages. I think the values that are instilled in Japanese youth are going to vary somewhat from those distilled in capitalist Western, you know, capitalist American youth, and that's reflected in the products that are made for, marketed to, and sold to us. So I think it's it's way oversimplifies to say that you know Americans like violence more than Japanese. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's more that you know we have a certain tech culture around video games that's marketed to young men, and it's manifested itself successfully in certain ways that the companies then repeat. Um, similarly, in Japan, they make things that audiences have historically liked and repeat what works. And you start to wonder, you know, is it Japanese people like this while American people like this, or 
this is what's worked in Japan and is being repeated, and this is what's worked here and is being repeated. I think, um, I don't know, like, the game industry at, in the late 90s in America was built and sold on, on JRPGs, so at the time, you know, when Japan was in when Japan led, led the world in games, clearly what we liked was quite similar. So I think, um, I think the market's changed. I don't think we can draw massive conclusions about the difference between us and the Japanese um, in this particular case. Um, I will say, because it's an issue that's always interested in me, interested me when studying um, Japanese games, particularly Resident Evil, which has westernized over the years pretty intentionally. There was a movement as as the Japanese industry stopped being as profitable as it used to. There was a movement for them to westernize all their popular franchises and try to tailor it more um, toward what has sold here and what has worked here. Um, one thing that I noticed when I, because I, I like to watch horror films, Japanese horror is often about the unseen and it's about ghosts and ancestors and the invisible and history and, and the fear that you can't touch. Whereas Western horror is very much slasher film, you always see the killer at the end. Um, it's in your face, there's blood, you're, you know, the, the things that we are afraid of seem to be different from our culture to, to Japanese culture. And I think that might affect the way we make suspenseful games. I think a, a, a Japanese horror game is going to look very different from an American horror game. And I'm fascinated by the way the Resident Evil series has changed because I think that is some place where we can really see cultural differences moving away from the mystery and the mansion and, you know, the occasional jump scares, but mostly it would be about these haunted places and wondering if you could survive um, mm -hmm. and then moving into action games. And but, then the, um, first, the first few Resident Evils, you would, like you said, it was about the unseen. The camera angle would be set in such a way that you'd be hearing something, you'd get the sense that something bad was going to happen, it was mm -hmm. that anticipation of, um, and compare that to something like Left 4 Dead, which scared a lot of people, even though it's an action game, where it's yeah. just about piling on the cheese. It's just like, yeah. all right, 50 zombies, 60 zombies, 70 zombies. Which is about the fear of, like, Left 4 Dead relies on frightening you. You're afraid that you might not be able to react in time. You know, you're afraid that you might not be able to handle the physical threat. I'm terrified mm -hmm. of The Last of Us because I can't stand something bearing down on me. Um, mm -hmm. I, but, you know, it, the Japanese games that frightened me were about what is around the corner. What can't I see? Do I have enough supplies? I don't know because I don't know what's ahead. So there were very different types of, of, of ways that we create fear. Um, however, like, the game of the year, like, last year was Walking Dead, which mm -hmm. is not a game about fighting, you know, and I think that that represents the fact that you know, we as a Western audience still very much have appetites for these things. We're not exclusively an action-oriented audience. I can't tell you how many friends I have who say, I'll come back to video games when there's another good Final Fantasy, you know? Um, so I think it's, it's, an, it's a business trying to figure out how to accommodate a wide variety of appetites in both countries without taking on too much risk because video games are basically too expensive to make anymore. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh... It's been very interesting for me to watch, and it sounds like it's been interesting for you to watch, too, how the idea of what's cool in a video game has bent in different directions at different times. And, and like you were saying before, what sold in Japan, what was marketed in Japan, what uh, the, the ideas that were instilled in people as to what they can feel good about themselves for liking in Japan uh, are built upon each other. You know, you mm -hmm. like games that look like this, uh, you know, Ten years ago, you got to change them a little bit, but you kind of still stay in that direction because you don't want to take too big of a risk because it might bomb. And the same, the United States, which is more and more towards the the Hollywood blockbuster direction, and and now Japan trying to take a little bit from what is seen as cool in here. But but in general, I, I think what I'm trying to say is that when I make these kind of broad generalizations about what Japan likes, what America likes, it's not so much what that whole country likes. It's about what, what, what the market, what country. looks like it's happening in the market. And what um, the, the market's told to like. What what makes people feel good about themselves for liking is often pretty different culturally. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Um, and one thing that's it's important to point out that we talk about sales and what sells and what sells. Um, a really important factor in this equation is actually profits. Mm. That the budgets of games are increasing while... Um, you know, install bases are decreasing. Like, you know, the addressable audience is getting smaller. A lot of people have aged out of video games, but companies have invested in just making a bigger, better sequel to the one. You know, not everyone is like us and carries on playing as adults. If you mm. give them just a bigger sequel to the game they liked before, they're not going to move on with you as a brand. You know what I mean? So video games are simultaneously getting expensive to make as their core audience is now too old to have the time to play 60-hour video games anymore. So the profits are decreasing. Um, 
you know, they could sell, you know, there are sales numbers now that would have looked very good in the 90s, but the profit margins are low because the cost investment required to make one installment top another is not is not keeping up. The audience isn't growing at the rate that the cost of making games is growing, basically. Um, so if the Japanese industry is suffering, it's because of how much it costs to make video games is not, you know, the, the population is not keeping up with that. It's not delivering, you know, some franchises, Pokemon, Monster Hunter, you know, 3DS, you know, they're still being able to sort of keep up. But, um... But they're not making Minecraft kind of money or, right. or even, you know, Candy Crush Saga kind of money. There's this whole other way of making a game these days that seems to be making people a lot more money. And I'm interested to see if people will, if Sony and Nintendo will start trying to ape from that more often. But I want to talk more about you, Lee Alexander. How has it okay. been for, for you to, because uh, it speaks to um, where you're at and where I feel like I'm at in this whole video game world where we used to be the target audience and in a lot of ways we no longer are. How has that been yeah. for you to, to grow up, still have video games be uh, a big part of your life, uh, at times the, the center of your professional life, but at the same time no longer be the person who is considered kind of the, the core market for what you're writing about? You know, it's not that different to tell you the truth because... All my life there were games I didn't like, and there were games that mm -hmm. weren't for me. I never played StarCraft. I was not a Doom person. I wanted to play Myst. You know, like, I was always um, feeling like there were games I liked that nobody else knew about. Um, mm -hmm. Even though, you know, now my history looks pretty normal. It was like JRPGs and adventure games, which is true for a lot of people. Um, I always felt like I was in a minority um, at the time. And now... You know, as you as we were saying, that it's it's it nearly the games that we know about Call of Duty, GTA, and you know maybe one more franchise, Assassin's Creed, are like the mm -hmm. only profitable AAA franchises. Those are three games. Everyone mm -hmm. else is having to be profitable on um, smaller production costs. That's why Sony's courting indies. Like the industry is just changing, and mm -hmm. I feel like by having kept up with that, I'm finally talking to people like me for the first time. Mm -hmm. um, I look at the way that uh, the traditional industry is being marketed, and it's not for me. Like, you know, E3 is not for me. I'm not going to be addressed at PAX, for example, um, with that kind of culture or that kind of tone. But I never really did feel like a gamer. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. gamer is a, ca a category created by marketers um, to sort of mobilize men 18 to 25, and I've never been that. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? Um, and I think the only people who haven't realized that that is a false market category to a certain extent, or that doesn't is not a, is not a representative market category. Are people who are in it, and there mm -hmm. you happen to be the loudest on the internet. So I um, yeah, I can go to like Eurogamer Expo, and I can go to a games event and see the stalls with the neon Mountain Dew, and feel like it's for kids and not for me. But to me, that's not where the game industry is right now. And mm -hmm. if it's the it's the biggest and the loudest, but it isn't even going to be that for that much longer. I mean, there'll always be blockbusters, but to say that I'm not being addressed by games anymore. It's just like, what if I was a cinema fan? Mm. And I feel like, could I say I'm not being addressed by movies anymore because of all the uh, superhero movies? No, there's always going to be the superhero movies, but there's also always going to be Sundance. You know, and cinema mm. as an art continues, I mean, I think probably continues to progress. Um, we're finally at the point where people can understand that gaming is more than the superhero film. Mm -hmm. You know, like, now gaming is... We're, we're finally seeing that there's room for a game industry that isn't only, you know, AAA sequels. And um, it's more possible for me to feel included in games than ever. Um, so I do feel aged... You know, I, do, I don't feel included in the traditional industry, but I never did. And now there's alternatives to the traditional industry that are exciting, and that I can sell articles about that people want to talk to me about in parties. You know, I go now... You know, five years ago, when I said what I did in, in parties with grown-ups, um, people were like, oh, you mean those violent things? Like, do you play them? Do you have to play them? I was like, yeah, I have to play them. Um, <laughs> but now, you know, I go and people are like, oh, you know, I just read an article about how games can be used for learning. And I'll say, yes, you know, like I spoke to someone who's working in that field, and I can have adult conversations with people about games. Or, you know, someone will say, oh, you know, I, I, I happened to see the piece you did in The Guardian about, you know, people using games to raise their voices for the first time. I think that's beautiful. You know, now I can actually have adult conversations about games, or I'm starting to, and this is the first time for me in history that that has happened and that could happen. So I, I feel like there's a possibility for games to grow up. I don't feel like I'm getting too old for games in general, or not games as I understand them. That's freaking fantastic. 
It feels so much better now. Yeah, yeah like, like thinking, there's oh, more no. games. Just cover <laughs> other ones. Like I don't think we have to be 40 and pretending we think Assassin's Creed 20 is cool. All respect to the Assassin's Creed team. They do beautiful. They're beautiful work at what they do. We're not gonna like that forever. We don't have to pretend that we do. You know, like, go to a conference about, you know, games for health or games for learning or games for social good. Talk to someone like Merritt who's using games to talk about her experience in a way that's never been heard in the game space before. You know, like, look at Twine Games. Make your own game. Now you can make a game for your mom that she can play. We could not do that five years ago. This is awesome. You know, like, it's a great time to be in games. Um, I want to take that clip and just play it every day. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Lee. That'll help me get up in the morning. Uh, we have a bunch of questions that came in from people in the stream. Oh, no. oh I'm, I'm kind of frightened. Uh, oh, you'll do wonderful. And they're also <laughs> moderated by Sinistar, so uh, he does a fantastic job of doing the best questions. Oh, there's so much other stuff I wanted to talk to you about, though. Oh, the whole idea of how what's cool where is shaped by what we're fed and how... People feel good about themselves in GTA when the satire happens, so they can laugh at other people and then go back to killing the other satire. people. The satire. Yeah, the satire. Oh, we'll probably never get to that. Anyway, I will do the questions because I'm a okay host. I am. Thank you. C-minus. Oh, thank you. Pyroari asks, "What do you think about the Steam or no sale mentality that's kind of big right now?" A lot of good indie the what games. mentality? The Steam or no sale mentality, which I believe they mean. And they go on to explain a little bit. A lot of good indie games seem to suffer from this, but with messages like, I'll buy it when it's on Steam. And on Destructoid, I see that a lot. Yeah. I'll post about a smaller game, or a, uh, I think it just happened today, actually, about a game called Potato Man Seeks the Truth, which is a fun little game. Someone just immediately, and it's coming to Ouya next week, people were like, oh, well, I'll get it if it's on Steam. And there's this whole chase amongst everybody I know who makes their own video games isn't part of a, a publisher to hopefully get, get on Steam. Steam. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So what? Uh, you've watched that happen. You've been doing this before. Yeah, Steam it's hard around, to tell because the distribu- distribution channels are so disrupted right now that it's really hard to tell um, what is a good business strategy for indies and what isn't. I mean, I know that I'm... I kind of have my fingers crossed that I can get a Steam box and not a console, like that I can just have that. Mm. Um, mm-hmm. Most of my favorite games this year have either been on Steam or free. Um, but, like, I think a lot of a lot of indie sales have happened through bundles, like that, you know, they appears on bundles, but it's like, any way we've bought video games in the past, people have waited for it to appear in a format that they want at a price they want. That's nothing really new, and this is just, I think, indies are now being subject to the same market forces that everyone else is, which is, you know, pretty reasonable. Um, so what I think about that mentality is that people should buy games when they're on the platform they want at a price that they think is fair. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, um, I don't really know what else to say about it other than that. No, 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 very good. It, it's a lot of power for Valve to have, mm-hmm. which I don't think they intended. I don't think that no. they... I get the sense when they started Steam, they didn't think we are going to like either cause people to die or to be rich. You know, well, that's we'll why I think that's why they're investing so much in Greenlight. They're really wanting to offload the pub- publishing process onto the community. Um, mm-hmm. I don't always like the wisdom of the crowds thing, and anyone who reads internet comments would probably know why I feel that way. Um, I think that you know, in the next several years, most things on the internet are going to be crowdsourced, and that curators, whether they're professional publishers or just individuals with good taste that are entrusted within the community by curating a selection of things, curation is, is going to be the most important thing that comes out of the next 10 years. Um, I would like to see Valve continue to act as curator until we have a better system in place. But, um, I don't know, yeah, you're right. It puts Valve in a position of a lot of power, and it'll be interesting to see, you know, how that shapes up. Yeah, I hope they can uh, distribute that power, disperse it in some way, because they don't. It's seem a lot of yeah. It's yeah. it's a lot of work for Valve to be doing, considering that they've not really done that in the past, and were very much a boutique development house. And now they own probably the most promising platform of the 21st century in games. So. Yeah. So fun to I watch. Mean, this stuff happen. They've never screwed any. Valve has never screwed anything up. Has Valve ever screwed anything up? Not that I've seen. No. Right. So I mean, let's just see what Valve does. It's Valve. <laughs> you know. It's good to be optimistic. I like that. Uh, Gregory yeah. Nazarian asks, question, colon, what games have come in the past couple of years that you think have tried something new and or have made a difference? Huh, games interesting. Games have there... tried something new or made a difference. God. Yeah. I mean, I... 
Do I, does he mean commercial games? I mean, like I get like I always have to ask because like my favorite game this year is Papers Please. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you've played that or covered it on Destructoid, but I'm. Papers, please, asks you to act as a border control officer, and you're processing the paperwork of everyone who's trying to enter your country. Um, and it's it's hard, and it's fun, because you've got to keep all the documents uh, straight and remember what all the regulations are. Um, but it's also really moving, because you have to make choices. Like, you know, what if a guy's papers aren't quite in order, but you think he's legit? Do you let him in, even if you starve? What if you think your country might be abusing people? You know, it's asking... It goes inside bureaucracy and asks you to consider the human components of bureaucracy and the human cost of bureaucracy in a way that I think it makes a difference for me. And it's also been a game that I can talk about with non-gamers because obviously national security and you know moral panic around nationalism is a thing that you know people care about in the modern age, especially you know you know with everything that's going on in the world now. So um, yeah, I think that games that can start and continue conversations about real world issues are the ones that I'm interested in right now. Um, I really love like Merit's work, for example, because she has a candor um, and an intimacy about um, how she talks about herself in her games that when I play them, I feel a little closer to another human being, like a real person, not a character, not an AI, not a glassy facial model that was made by David Cage or Bioware or something. Um, and I think that games that have the power to bring me closer to another person's experience are making a difference and, and will continue to. So those are just some examples. Um, I write constantly about games that I think are different or that are making a difference. So if you want to follow some more of my recommendations, I'm at LeeAlexander.net and I'm really just trying to shout about games that I love that I think are special. So Yeah, there's plenty of that. People should definitely... And on Twitter, too. You, you've pointed a lot of things out there. Yeah, and I love, um, I love... I um, love... I love free indie game dot e s it's f r e e i n d i e g a m e g a m dot e s free indie games the website and then indie static um, profiling things I think in a really um, avant garde and intelligent uh, way and even if they're not like games that you would pay money for most of the time they're free and you get to see someone try something unique through game design which I think is important for anyone who professes to be a fan of the medium they should be looking at the experimentation and and the new creative leadership and not just buying the corporate stuff. Mm -hmm. So yeah, like being being a games fan who only gets your games off shelves is like saying you're a foodie but only eating Doritos. So, <laughs> so you should definitely but a lot of people site. love food who only eat Doritos and French. I love look. I love my favorite food is grilled cheese. But if I had guests over for a dinner party, I would I would want to be able to cook. Absolutely, what a nice food metaphor. One of my favorites I've heard in a while. I usually do the hamburger one, but uh, the the grilled cheese one's good too. Um, Bowser Press asks, how does being on the staff of a publication differ from freelancing? Well, that's a great question. Um, well, for one, when you're on staff of the publication, you're generally involved very closely in the day-to-day -day processes. You you uh, are responsible for uh, upholding the editorial vision with everyone else. Um, you can't work for anyone else. So you can, you know, basically the times that I was on staff, even when I had leadership to assign articles to other people, I was, you know, I was still operating under an editorial umbrella. Um, I had a regular paycheck and I had benefits, but I did not have nearly as much freedom. Um, I've been lucky in that the people that have hired me have usually let, you know, trusted my judgment on subject matter and I haven't been edited with a tyrannical hand or told what to do um, in, a, in a really destructive way. Um, but now that I'm freelance, um, I can write about whatever I want, but I also have to hustle every day. I have to have a good idea every day. Um, yes, I can be in The Guardian and The Atlantic and The New Statesman in one month, but I have to have the ideas that make it happen. No one tells me what to do. No one suggests a topic to me. Um, when I was on staff, I used to get PR invitations all the time. Do you want to interview this person? Do you want to interview that person? Now, if I want to sign up to go to a press event, even though I have like 30,000 Twitter followers, they'll say, well, who do you write for? But I haven't decided who I'm covering this for yet. Like, yeah, you know, we, we need like certified games magazines. Like, you know, if I'm not on staff at, you know, if I told them I was on staff at IGN, I would be in no problem. But, you know, I'm not, you know. So being a staff writer tends to get you more access, um, tends to get you more stability and more benefits, but you have less freedom to uh, choose your own work. I probably could have said that in one sentence. I'm sorry, Bowser. <laughs> oh, I thought you did great. I wonder if there'll be a time where that changes too, just as Sony is looking at people, two-man team, two-woman team making a game and be like, yeah, sure, we'll, we'll put them on E3, whether the Let's Players and the freelancers and the people with just a really popular blog on their own are going to be um, put in the front 
Uh, it will happen, uh, and it's already happening, particularly as regards Let's Players and video people. Um, people are consuming more and more of their game content through video, and a, a pundit with a popular YouTube channel and a strong opinion um, is going to have much more um, impact on the climate than like a staff writer at a major games magazine that you've heard of. Um, so yeah, it, it, content is democratizing a bit more. Um, mm -hmm. PR people still want to know that they're basically not wasting their time and money on you, like th mm -hmm. that you'll have the reach to make a difference, whether positively or negatively. I wonder, um, do you want to start doing more video content? No, maybe kind of? no, 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 no. Um, it, it sucks enough being a, a loud woman who only types. If I had to have my face out there, it would be bad for me. I wouldn't like it. Mm -hmm. I imagine. But it's a shame for me because uh, you're so good at talking and so personable <laughs> and make it... Uh. Like, you are. You're great at talking, and I know it's hard to take compliments. Well, you think so, but you know it is impossible for me to be agreed upon. There is not any like not everyone would agree. Some people would say, you know, my voice is too this, or my voice is too that, or my, you know, I talk too much, or I talk too fast. Like if it, I think particularly if you're a woman, you're going to get feedback on how you look, how you sound, and how you come across um, at an enhanced volume relative to what men get. And I'm just mm -hmm. I just don't want to deal with that. Like I don't want to work hard on something and have to read comments about what I look like or what I sound like. I would rather just yeah. write and have them tell me I'm an idiot or a bitch, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Happens to every woman I know in this industry. Um, I used to host the Destructoid show, and I think by by the fifth episode, my co-host, Tara Long, wore a spacesuit to yeah. the show. Because she's yeah. just like, I'm sick of people just commenting on how low or high cut my shirt is and not If you're pretty, it's it. a problem. If they think you're pretty, it's a problem. If they think you're ugly, it's a problem. If you're showing your body, they're going to have something to say about it. If they, if you only go on camera from the neck up, they're going to say, oh, she's probably fat. Like, there's something, it's, it's a nightmare. And I write, I write. I like to write. I think mm -hmm. writing is what I'm good at. And um, I have no interest in using my face or voice or body if I can use my words. Absolutely. I don't blame you. But selfishly, I hope the climate changes so you feel differently about well, it. I, I feel very comfortable on this show. I would like to come on again if you'd like. If you'll oh have yeah, to. absolutely. You we'll can tag have the team show. Interrogate some game developer about his mission. <laughs> there is nobody I would rather. If there were ever a time, if I was on my deathbed, I would will the show to you. Oh, you certainly. Wow. Okay. Well, I hope you're never if on you your take deathbed. If you take it, of course. Because I would. Well, just, uh, I know. would give it to Jim Sterling and let him finish it. <laughs> <laughs> then everybody would watch it. People yeah. love it when he talks. Uh, Graffier asks, how long do you think that Sony's current courting of indie games will last for? Is there still a time for Microsoft to join in and success successfully appeal to indie developers? Microsoft's huh. been trying. Yeah. Um, so when people say how long or when or what will the future hold, I'm always hesitant because you don't have a crystal ball. And uh, my job is to analyze what's happening now and not to predict the future in any you know, that's why you know people don't like games industry analysts anymore because their predictions are often wrong. Um, mm -hmm. So rather than tell you how long I think this will last, I will tell you what I do know, which is that Microsoft has historically a terrible track record of working with indie developers. Um, their Xbox Live indie games program didn't um, do what you know didn't do what Microsoft hoped it would do. Um, a lot of indies tell me that working with Microsoft as an organization is not a good experience for them. Um, and that, uh, you know, the certification and all the rules, it's a bit like trying to get on the App Store. Like, for example, like if you're an app developer, would you rather go on iTunes or Android? You know, it's, it's a very similar choice indies are making. And uh, right now the Android market is blowing up because come to find out it's a bit easier in a lot of ways to go on Android and you can make just as much money um, in some cases. Um, I think Sony's courting of indies will continue for as long as this is proven to be a profitable strategy. Right now it's winning them public image, and right now it's winning them the loyalty of developers, which is, again, important because most, you know, they have the guys that are on 600-person teams already. They want the rest of the game developers. Um, I think now that we're moving out of physical retail, and that consoles are going to be, you know, live or die on uh, what's digitally available on them. Having a compelling channel with downloadable content um, is, is going to be important for console holders, and indies have been working only in that channel all this time. In a way, right now, indies are ahead of the game because they don't come from a world where you have to ship something on a disc and forget about it. Indies are used to um, making products that are ready to launch digitally and, and are ready to have a community around them day one. So I think 
um, the experience and the culture of, of indie developers is as important to a console manufacturer right now as um, as anything else. And uh, I wonder if Microsoft will catch up. We'll see. Um, it's very hard. It'll be very hard for them to undo um, the goodwill that they squandered in the 360 generation by alienating the indie community. Then, so we'll see. Yeah, it'll be interesting to find out and to see how well indie games do on consoles. Uh, most of the best indie developers I know are, like you said, so ahead of the game in terms of knowing that the audience doesn't have a lot of time. They're going to want to get an idea or a feeling or an event pretty quickly, and they um, know how to, to deliver that in a way that's um, the successful ones anyway, that's uh, palatable and uh, intuitive and easy to get involved with. And uh, how, that, how that's going to do on consoles, though, I'm, I'm worried that... I don't know. We'll see. Yeah. I mean, it's important to note that most of the games that most of the indies that Sony is advertising its affiliation with are not in exclusivity agreements with them. So you can get those games on Steam six months later. Um, sure. So, yeah, it, it we'll see. It's hard to tell. Yeah, absolutely. No way to predict. But I'm yep. I'm hoping they do well there, and I hope that becomes the the industry standard. Me to too. Me too. Like them. Uh, anyway, uh, E. Elvac, I think I pronounced that right, asks, will you be doing more work for Shut Up, Sit Down? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I uh, Shut Up and Sit Down is a board game website based here in the UK that my friends operate, and I was uh, hanging out with them at the Eurogamer Expo this last weekend, playing, uh, helping play some card games at the booth. I've gotten really into physical um, card and board games lately. Um, I think that's been part of the conundrum that we were talking about. You become an adult in the culture of digital games is less familiar. Mm. Um, there are card and board games now that feel modern and fresh and approachable and you can teach them to anybody and there are ways that you can use game design and social play you know, in public with people. It's ways to bring friends closer together. I've been playing so many more board and card games and tabletop role playing as well which was not something I did when I was younger. Um, I used to think tabletop role playing was like I needed nine million dice and I had to swing my sword at a dragon and try to get the treasure from the Lich Lord and all these things. But right now we're playing, my friends, my role-playing group here is playing a game about teenage monsters in high school and they're just trying to get sex from each other and be in love. So like, even, you know, board games have diversified and become more attractive too. So absolutely, yeah, I'm going to continue um, doing indie role-play reviews with Shut Up and Sit Down and uh, generally hanging out and supporting them there because I think they're great. What's that teenage monster game called? Monster Hearts. It's Yeah, it's called Mar Monster Hearts. Um, Sounds you should awesome. Google it right now. Monster Hearts is all one word, and uh, it's pretty easy to teach and learn. Um, I've been playing it with a, a bunch of friends here on a regular basis, and uh, well, we've done a few nice long sessions. And uh, yeah, it's it's kind of funny. I'm playing a I'm playing a ghost who uh, blames the popular girl's neglect for her death, and uh, my friend Lori is playing a ghoul who needs to eat human hearts to stay alive, and uh, she might accidentally be caught in, in having murdered a teacher. Um, yeah, like, and everyone's in love with it. Each person at the table is in love with a different person at the table, and uh, it's, it's like uh, Twilight meets Buffy meets, I don't know, some dark, twisted fantasy that Kieran Gillen has, because he's in our group, so, yeah, it's, it's fun. Awesome. That sounds yeah. great. What a nice, uh, simple, sweet metaphor that people can relate with quickly, which is something video games can do, but don't always do. Interesting. I, I used to see tabletop games as kind of you needed to be able to be so into a fantasy that you could. Have That's what your, I thought uh, as well. I was really. Yeah. I was like, no way. I'm just too nerdy. Mm -hmm. But these but, days, um, uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. No. I was like, That's too nerdy. It's like really theme heavy. You have to be into elves and orcs and rolling dice and writing on paper and. I don't play any games like that when I play board games with my friends. I play, like, we play this game that resists, like, someone's a spy and they lie to you. Um, but, yeah, um, if you go to Shut Up and Sit Down, they do really funny video series um, and uh, will introduce you to the games that are really actually quite accessible. If you Sometimes, like, you know you know when you're in a party and people are like, oh, I don't play video games. They seem really complicated. And you're like, no, listen, there's one for you. It's like that with board games as well. I, I, anyone who likes games at all should check out um check out their board game reviews because it's really fun. I uh, Someone introduced me, Caitlin Cook, who writes for this site, uh, writes for this chapter, right, introduced me to Resistance like a month ago. Unbelievable. Yeah. We played so for hours fun. and hours and hours. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now they have and, an Avalon version, which is a complicated King Arthur version with more different kinds of spies, and it's just so good. Huh. I'll have to check that out. Uh, more yes, questions coming in. Squidly Doo asks, 
Do you think there's any person or company that could make a JRPG that allowed itself to age with its audience? Uh, hmm. Interesting. Uh, it depends couple. what you mean by age that allowed yeah. itself to age with its audience. Um, Maybe for you. I guess we can only speak for ourselves. So can you imagine a company that could make a new JRPG that, and for all I know, maybe you've been following along with JRPGs. Maybe there is one that has aged with your tastes and your perspectives and whatnot. But I still love to happen? play vintage RPGs. I think vintage RPGs are work of art, works of art. I play like Fantasy Star 2, which is like the ugliest and most counterintuitive game, but I, I really like it aesthetically, like an artifact. And Chrono Trigger holds up for me. FF7 holds up for me. Um, believe it or not, and uh, I don't know, but JRPGs in particular, the story arc is always about, you know, the boy, because it's usually a boy, the boy leaves his house to become a man. Um, mm -hmm. He starts out being powerless, um, first he learns to conquer the lands around his town, and then, you know, he makes friends and goes into the mountains. By the end, he has a huge sword and he's fighting God. You know, they are coming-of-age stories to begin with. Um, they're about conquering, you know, the things that you used to fear. So I feel like a JRPG for adults would look at, you know, what is this? What is our next fear to be conquered? What's our, what's the equivalent for an adult of stepping outside your childhood home? You know, maybe it's, you know, you've been stuck in a rut your whole life and now you've got to expand, or you don't feel powerful because of the decisions you've made. How can you undo that? You know, mm. I think a JRPG for adults would look at ways of ways of subverting that traditional narrative arc to make it relevant to a new generation of people. Mm -hmm. I thought Catherine kind of, sort of, almost. It tried. tried. To, yeah. I love that it tried. I actually really mm. like that game, and I love that. I don't think that it was an, it's successful in everything that it wanted to do, but I love it for trying. Yeah, and it's successful, maybe unintentionally. And I feel the same way about Killer Is Dead. I was talking about this. I've not played that one yet. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I've heard that I could maybe skip it. Well, it is at least for a little bit. It is one of the most awesome parodies and really attacks on heterosexual dating habits. Mm. Like, it just makes fun of guys so hard. I without meaning to. I, see, no, see I, I lo I've loved every Grasshopper game. Like, no more, like the first No More Heroes, I, I thought it was wonderfully subversive. I thought it was mm. really, really smart. Um, I really liked it. So uh, everyone said this was kind of like Suda going wrong or taking a hard left, but I don't know. Maybe I think I they're sick uh... of them. Yeah, I think they're bored. You know how a lot of people feel like they've seen every Tim Burton movie? Even mm -hmm. when he comes out with a new one, they're like, I've seen that already. You made That's that a good before. analogy. I bet you're right. Yeah. I feel like they're on to one. But I still got a lot out of Killer is Dead. We have three minutes, rats. One uh, more question. Uh, I they're all... One more question. I'll give a fast answer. I want to do a question. Uh, can you do it, though? I don't know. We'll see if Sunstar brings us a question from someone watching. And if not, I'll just ask what you think is cool. Because cool, in my mind, has been with this last generation of uh, video game consoles it's been about. The Wii managed to make it cool to play video games by being anti-video game. That worked in the United States, that worked in Japan, that worked almost everywhere to be like, oh, you know, you thought video games were for nerds. Be not a nerd and play a video game. Like baseball. Everyone loves baseball, right? Yeah. And Xbox made it cool by giving you achievements and making you feel like you're a better person for having played more video games, even if you didn't like them. Sony just threw the book at everybody and was like, you'll have the best machine ever. You're the coolest guy in town with this trophy device. Um, yeah, I mean, selling anything is about coolness, but yeah. the thing I think is cool about the generation to come now is openness. So you've mm. seen, like, so even, like, Watch Dogs is about hackers. We're seeing the rise of Anonymous. We're seeing paranoia about information and what can be done with information. We're worried about what all of this information that we've put out there on the internet has done to us. We're worried about our relationships to corporations and how much access they have um, to us. And we're worried about the patriarchy, the status quo, and oppression. Um, so I think that Steambox is talking about being a totally open system that's like customizable, moddable, that games are going to be open and moddable, that tools are accessible, that the veil of mystery is being blown off of game creation. Um, a game industry that anyone can access and participate in and take ownership of, that is less um, out of the hands of the, you know, tr the way that we think of the closed walled garden, cl console wall, retail wall. You know, openness is, is the cool watchword for the coming generation, I think. And uh, hopefully it'll be a fresh, breath of fresh air on how people think about games. I hope so. I hope Neo... I hope that's it's cool to be the Neo of video games and just kick that guy in the face. That jerk in the face that's been holding the keys to the world against you for your whole life and you didn't know it. We know Kung Fu. <laughs>
<laughs> we couldn't end on a better note than that, Lee Alexander. <laughs> um, people can follow you on LeeAlexander.net, or they can go to your site and see. The yeah, things follow me on Twitter at your own risk. I tweet. I do tweet my links a lot, but um, I'm I'm trying to reduce the uh, argumentative rambling. Um, my links are on Twitter, or you could like me on Facebook. That's where I only post links and no talking. Or you can check my website every so often at LeeAlexander.net. And in terms of websites you're on, you're at. Guardian, do you still work for Kotaku at all? I haven't seen anything. Uh, yeah, I did. Well, yeah, well. I'm, I'm a bit late. Uh, Stephen, I'm really sorry. Um, I'm a bit late, but I have a monthly at Kotaku. I have a monthly column in Edge magazine. I, uh, uh, Quentin Smith and I do features in Polygon every month or so where we do letter series on, on various video games. I update LeeAlexander.net all the time with all my freelance work, so if you're interested in reading my articles, that's probably the place to start. And thank you for curating games, too. I really oh, appreciate I try. That. And there's so many good that, people yeah. trying to do that. And like in some ways, you know, if I look at stuff on free indie games or indie static or whatever, I'm just amplifying the efforts of you know, like I, you know, I always get games from individuals that I respect and and people that are working quietly and tirelessly in the community. Um, so you know, when you find something you like, amplify it. That's like the good way. That's a way to be for anybody to be a curator. You don't have to be a professional to be making a difference if you look at it that way. Absolutely, rats. You have to end, I guess. Yeah, Ugh. I gotta go. My housemates have just come home. I'd like to go have uh, have a drink with them. But um, thank you so much for having me. This has been really nice. My pleasure. It was uh, almost too good. I couldn't <laughs> keep up with you. I tried. I tried to keep. I'm sorry. Up. I talked so much. so much. I just I've had such no, a long wonderful. weekend and. Everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Never feel sorry for talking on a talk show because that's exactly what I was hoping for. Uh, okay, was, cool. Yeah, and definitely be on again. Okay, I guess we wave goodbye. Okay. All right, goodbye. Thank you so much for having me. Let's talk soon. Bye.